Hello, everyone. It's Takuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast. My friends, by this time, if you're watching this on YouTube, you've probably already noticed that I am by myself. And also from that, there isn't really a video that is going with that here. Uh, the reason being is that I am currently sitting here freezing in my garage while Gabby is inside sick and working on some schoolwork that she needs to get done. So we are trying to crank this out as quickly as we possibly can before it is that we have to leave onto a trip. But on that note, I want to say that if you're watching this on YouTube, then make sure to go ahead and like the video because it's something that really does help me. And simultaneously, if you're listening to this on Spotify, on Apple, or on anything else like that for podcast, then if you leave us a review, that is, again, also something that really helps us. But anyway, on to today's topic that I wanted to talk about because I really wanted to just go ahead and jump into things. As I'm sure many of you are aware, in the previous several months, the majority of what it is that we've been covering is largely Western-themed, typically. And I don't mean like Wild West. I mean, it's usually been something with America or Europe or something along those lines. We haven't really covered all that much of other parts of the world. Like, yes, in these previous weeks, we did cover the Sepoy Rebellion, which is awesome. I did love going into that. But simultaneously, I think that we do need to cover a lot more, which is why I wanted to talk about one of my favorite conflicts, which, ironically enough, when a lot of these are my favorite conflicts to talk about that have such interesting stories, Usually, those end up coming out of China. My favorite war overall is the Taiping Rebellion. I, I, the fact that a guy went on to be, like, declare himself to be the brother of Jesus Christ and lead a rebellion against the government that ultimately ended up killing more people than World War I, that is truly insane. But that's not what we're talking about here, because I know that I've done a, a video on that before. What I wanted to talk about here is the Boxer Uprising or the Boxer Rebellion because that is a whole other crazy shit show altogether. So, for those of you who are not aware, the Boxer Rebellion was a Chinese rebellion against foreign influence in areas such as trade, politics, religion, and technology, and this is something that had occurred back in China during the final years of the Qing Dynasty, this being when it was basically collapsing over the course of November 1899 all the way through September 7th, 1901. It wasn't a long one necessarily, but it did go a decent amount of time. By August of 1900, over 230 foreigners, tens of thousands of Chinese Christians, and we don't really know how many rebels. The number ranges from just like 10,000 to 100,000 or more. You never really know. But all of these varying people, innocent bystanders, were killed in the chaos that would come from this. But this conflict is so much more than just a simple rebellion. This is the story of the last great attempt to try and reform the Qing Empire and finally bring about modernity to China. It's about the first case of the international powers of like Japan, Russia, England, France, uh, Austria, Germany, Italy, all these varying groups, all these varying countries that had been competing with one another for decades now would act as a kind of international police force. Mind you, they were rivals, and they still went and worked together. And during all of this, there would be an epic siege of the legation quarter that would see the international community almost collapse. And all of this being done by peasants that totally thought that they were immune to bullets. Yeah, no, I'm, that, that, I, I'm not even kidding when I say that. This is the Boxer Rebellion, and in it, the Boxers genuinely believed that they were immune to bullets. So, okay, you all know how it is that we're working with this. We need to go in and explain a little bit of the context that leads up to the situation so you all understand what it is that I am talking about. In the closing decades of the 19th century, Beijing, or Peking, this was one of the most exciting diplomatic centers in the world. It is something that was truly massive of a grand scale. Its foreign legation quarter boasted representatives from all across the world, but from Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Russia, Spain, United States, the UK, Anyone that you can think of that was any kind of real power or player on the world stage, they were there. What's really interesting when we're talking about this, though, is that the Japanese were there in the gate, like they had their own presence. But this was really impressive because only a few decades earlier, Japan was basically its own medieval society. We're talking about something that was during the isolationist period of Japan, which was then forcefully opened to the world by the United States. That is something that also happened, which I probably need to do a podcast episode on with uh, Commodore Perry. Anyway, after all of that happened, 
Japan would go on and embrace modernity and would transform itself into a modern Western power. In fact, the Japanese had recently already beaten China in a war in 1895, the Sino-Japanese War, which would end up winning them their own unequal treaty with China that all the other Western powers had. But in addition to that, it allowed them to seize the island of Taiwan, as well as the Liaodong Peninsula, and effectively dominance over Korea, which was its own kind of wishy-washy state that was in a halfway state between independence and subservience to China. But instead, now, it was going to be Japan. In fact, the problem became that the victory that the Japanese had in the First Sino-Japanese War was so great that when they seized control over the strategic location of the Liaodong Peninsula, which is this little peninsula that ends up jutting out of northern China, which I'm sure if you're looking at this on Patreon, I will end up putting up pictures to show what it is that I am talking about, or even on YouTube, even though my face isn't on this, I know I'm going to put some pictures and some other stuff that goes on this so that people understand what it is that I'm referring to. Anyway, they seized this highly strategic location, and this is something that the European powers don't like. The French, the Germans, the Russians, they end up banding together and they basically tell Japan, hey, um, you need to give this up. This is too much. You can't break them down that badly. And Japan, listening to the Western powers, does this. It sells the Liaodong Peninsula that it took back to China. And oh my God, was this a total dick move by the Western powers as they didn't do this. They didn't tell Japan this advice out of a sense of like justice or fairness to not screw over the Chinese. No, 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 no. They just didn't want Japan, the new kid on the block, to get ahead of them. So the Western powers then proceeded to scramble to get their own concessions from the Chinese. As an example of this, uh, Qindao was acquired by Germany, Guangzhou An was acquired by France, and Weihaowei, and the new territories was taken by Britain. Japan's successful modernization would highlight just how incredibly backwards the Qing state was. China needed to change. I mean, if the century of humiliation that it had already been experiencing for the previous hundred years hadn't taught them that, this was something that was a crucial slap in the face that they needed. And in 1898, they almost did change. See, members of the Chinese court were very aware that they were not in a good situation. They had, in previous decades, implemented some limited types of reforms, but this was primarily targeted around the military. You didn't really do anything with the state, uh, with society, with all the other aspects that you actually need in order to modernize a state. Instead, the Qing military basically just imported modern weapons and was then partially trained by European instructors. Foreign investors were also invited in at this time to build railroads all across the country, but they didn't really do much else. The army was still under control of local officials, which meant that the military was feudal. It was medieval. And all of those foreign investors that were coming into the country meant that any time that something was being built, it wasn't being built because the Chinese state necessarily wanted it. It was being invested into because, well, now these foreign outside powers were going to be the ones that actually have control of it. So really, when we're talking about this, China's reforms were superficial. The Qing were willing to adopt Western technology, but they didn't want any of the stuff that they would actually need from, you know, modernizing society, their government, the way that literally anything operates so that you could actually utilize that to great effect. So in 1898, China's 27-year-old emperor, a guy by the name of Guangxu, would decide to do something. See, this was an individual who already had been influenced by a number of scholars that were more Western-oriented. And these would be people from Canton and Shanghai, where you could regularly make contact with foreigners. He looked at the countries around him. He looked at Japan. He looked at Russia. He looked at everything else from these states that were once backwards, but had rapidly modernized themselves and were now humiliating him and his country. And he wanted to emulate them. But there was a little bit of a problem. See, until now, the emperor was pretty much a figurehead, which sounds weird when we're talking about this with Chinese history, because the emperor was usually not a figurehead. But their circumstance is a bit, um, it, it, it's a bit murky. See, he wanted to take the lead on modernization. He wanted to assert his authority over the empire. 
But the problem was is that his mother was a bit of a super control freak, a woman by the name of Zixi. Now, you may remember us mentioning her before, either in one of the random episodes that we did in another episode of the podcast, or from any number of the shorts that I've done talking about this time period, because again, I find this extremely entertaining. Well, she is the individual that pretty much had control of things and wanted to keep things as they were. So Guangxu went and dismissed any of the reactionary officials that were stopping him from trying to modernize the country, and he instead replaced them with people that wanted to reform the country for a period of around 100 days. And for 100 days, the Chinese administration, uh, its education system, its finance system, its industry, its military politics, all of this stuff was going to be reformed during this time period, and it could have done something. See. Here's the thing. The government knew, again, that they had to make some kind of change. Something had to happen. And they were sufficiently alarmed in order to permit an individual by the name of Tang Youwei and Liang Qichao in order to propose reforms to Emperor Guangxu. And Guangxu agreed with them. Now, some of Kang's students were also given minor but strategic posts in the capital and other areas in order to help with the reforms, and the goals that they had were pretty widespread, but this is basically the idea of what it is that they needed to do. First off, they wanted to abolish the traditional examination system. This is something that had been continuing on for centuries and is something that would teach Chinese students in the Confucian classics, but not really anything about how to actually govern a country or science and math and stuff. That just wasn't really something that was done. So they wanted to get rid of that and replace it with something that was more modernized. They wanted to eliminate out of touch, not out of touch. What is the right word when I'm talking about this? They wanted to eliminate positions that didn't really do anything. We're talking about obsolete positions, like you would have a person that is the grand master of cups of the third kitchen. I, I don't know. I'm just making up titles here at that point. It's basically a, a title, a position that didn't do anything. There was no real work for it, but you still got paid a salary to do it. It's like one of those glory positions where you were given a fancy title as well as a stipend just in order to buy off your loyalty pretty much. So that, that was something that they wanted to get rid of in order to modernize things. They also wanted to establish Peking University as a place where sciences, liberal arts, and the Chinese classics would all be available for study but it would still be a modern school. This being along with establishing other agricultural schools in provinces and schools and colleges in all provinces and cities and just things that would bring about a modern education system that would actually study math and science instead of just literally old Confucian texts, which is a bit of a problem. Simultaneously, they wanted the nobility, particularly the rulers and the imperial family to go and study abroad, and they wanted to change the monarchy from being an absolute one to a constitutional one, something that was able to dis not dissipate. They wanted to be able to take the authority of the monarch and instead of having it concentrated all in one spot, be able to pass that down to some of the local provinces in order to be able to govern themselves efficiently and through a constitution. They also wanted to apply principles of capitalism in order to strengthen the economy and, naturally speaking, modernize China's military and adopt modern training. The reformers declared that China needed more than just self-strengthening. It needed more than just industry. It needed more than just simple money. They had to have developments within their institutions, within their ideology, within everything in order to actually make any of these reforms useful. But there's a little bit of a problem. See, opposition to the reforms was immense, particularly among the conservative ruling elite who for centuries had been running the country and they condemned this idea as being something that was too radical. They didn't want to completely let go of their power. And so they proposed that instead things be modernized more moderately, that they do it gradually. Conservatives like Prince Duan suspected that it wasn't actually local Chinese people that wanted to get this done. It wasn't the actual Qing government. No, 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 no. It was a foreign plot that was trying to introduce all this stuff to the Qing government and that it was their fault they were trying to take over and influence the country. It was due to the influence of individuals like foreign advisors such as Timothy Richards and Hirobumi. Duan wanted to expel all foreigners 
completely from China and go back to the way that things were. In addition to the reforms, the reformers plotted to forcefully remove the woman that we talked about, Empress Dowager Cixi, from power. A person called Pen Tong ended up asking General Yuan Shikai to kill Rong Lu. This would be a Manchu politician that had a high position within court, and from there, take control of the garrison that was located at Tianjin, and from there, be able to march on Beijing and arrest the Empress Dowager. However, Yuan had previously promised that he was going to support Rong Lu rather than kill him. So what he ended up doing is that he went to Rong Lu and informed him of the plot to take out the Empress Dowager. And so with the support of the conservatives as well as the armed forces that were commanded by Yuan Rong Lu, Cixi went and launched a coup on September 22nd, 1898 and took over control of the government. Wang Shu, the emperor, was put under house arrest in the Summer Palace, where he would remain for 10 years until he would die in 1908. And yes, yes, I, I know a number of people may be confused right now. Listen, this is something that is straight up done within politics. And the amount of times that we talk about regents of the emperor taking things over while the, uh, the emperor retires to a palace or something to live out the rest of their days. Yeah, this was his mother, and she did not care. No, 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 she just wanted power. The reforms were then immediately reversed, and their chief advocates, the people known as the Six Gentlemen of Wushu, this being Tan Sitong, Kang Guangren, which is Kang Youwei's brother, uh, Lin Chu, Yang Xinxu, Yang Ri, and Lui Guangdi. Ah, uh, yeah, they were all executed. The two principal leaders of the entire movement in the first place, Kang Youwei and his student, Liang Chichao, fled to Japan, where they would then found something called the Bao Huang Hui, which is the Protect the Emperor Society. And for years, what they would try to do is advocate in this foreign court to try and return a constitutional monarchy to China. Or I say try to return to, they wanted to return and then install a constitutional monarchy. It's not something that would actually end up working out. Tan Zetong, though, he refused to flee, and ultimately, as a result of that, he was executed. Now, does China get humiliated again on the world stage and then have to reverse their decision immediately like they've had to do in the past? No, actually. The reactionaries end up winning a big victory diplomatically, and it all starts when the Italians go and approach the Chinese court. And this is something that set the stage for the rebellion that we're trying to talk about. You see, the story goes that as a result of the diplomatic involvement of certain great powers in 1894 to 1895 with the Sino-Japanese War, China had been forced to provide certain concessions, one of which was giving Germany in 1898 the territory rights to Qiaoqiao Bay in Shantung, which is now Shandong, China, on a 99-year lease. In that same year, Italy wished to get involved in this process by claiming jurisdiction over the Sanmen Bay, which it would then use for commercial purposes. The trouble was, um, Italy hadn't actually been involved in the Sino-Japanese diplomatic negotiations, and as such, China just went, no, 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 we're, we're not, we're not going to do anything. China went and rejected the Italian claim, and this caused the Italian government to send an ultimatum to the Chinese. And this ultimatum, the Chinese just didn't do anything about it, they just straight up ignored it. As a result, on the 8th of March, 1899, the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Vice Admiral Cannavaro, as a show of power, went and ordered the Italian military battleships of Marco Polo and Elba to go and occupy the Sanman Bay in an attempt to try and force the Chinese to go and cede this territory to Italy. Despite the show of aggression, China refused to change their position, and the Italians eventually had to back down later that year when they realized that the United Kingdom wasn't actually going to help them. Now, although this might appear to be something that is very small, like just a little kerfuffle in a small bay along the East China Sea, it is thought nowadays by historians that these events went and convinced the imperial Chinese government to alter their strategy towards colonial powers. Then instead of making concessions to them, they now believe that they would be capable of standing up against them. And also for them to support the Boxers' rebellion against foreigners and against the Christian religion. Which, yes, I know at this point we've been talking a lot of uh, context going into the situation, and we haven't actually talked about the actual boxers. I get it. I, I understand. Okay, that brings us to the boxers. See, the boxers appeared 
in the 1800s, late 1800s, out of a movement that would arise in the Northeast. Specifically, the 1890s would see two new types of movements that would appear in this area. The first were something called the Big Swords, which is already a hilarious name that I love, but it was essentially a society made up of varying landowners and wealthier farmers and peasants who banded together in order to try and protect their property from bandits. These individuals believed that through a secret combination of breathing exercises as well as magical formulas, along with a bunch of charms, that you would actually be able to make yourself immune to being hurt. Like, that's not just from, like, bullets or anything. That's literally anything. You just wouldn't be able to be touched. The other movement was something called the spirit boxers. And the members of this society were typically the poorer people of the region, and they had many practices that were similar to the big swords, but they had more of an emphasis on healing through spiritual power rather than through combat, so to speak. And one of their major beliefs was that they could be possessed by spirits. By the end of the decade, these two movements had inspired a new one, something whose name could be translated as the Righteous Fists of Harmony, or the Boxers United in Righteousness, or in short, if we want to go ahead and describe it, the Boxers. The Boxers appeared very suddenly. It wasn't something that was ever really expected by anyone in Shandong province. And very quickly, it spread rapidly to the rest of Northeast China as they went and recruited people by traveling to new villages, setting up boxing grounds, usually located in local temples, and then publicly performing martial arts exercises and combat routines. See, this is the way that this whole thing would work, and it was kind of hilarious. Over the course of their performance, the boxers would go into a kind of trance or frenzy, and they would challenge anyone in the audience to go and attack them so that they could prove, like, hey, I am immune to all harm. You literally will not be able to hurt me from anything, and that includes those evil Western bullets. Now, naturally, because they are um, fighting people in a frenzy in public and waving a bunch of weapons around, uh, people did end up getting hurt. People did end up getting shot. That was something that regularly happened. One of the things as an example that would happen is that people would like, if they had a gun, would pull it out and test it. Um, yeah, naturally speaking, those individuals would end up dying. Uh, and <laughs> when that would happen, the response from the movement was not, okay, no, our practices don't work. The response was, oh, that person just wasn't a good boxer. <laughs> like they didn't do it right. <laughs> Like, it, it's literally the definition of talking into history of like every time someone says that real communism hasn't been tried and then real spiritual boxing hasn't actually been done. Yeah, no, it's, it's the same kind of crap. In October of 1898, a group of boxers would then go and attack the Christian community of Leotun village where a temple to the Jade Emperor had been converted into a Catholic church. Disputes had surrounded the church since 1869 when the temple had been granted to the Christian residents of the village. And the new spiritual groups and people like the boxers did not appreciate them at all. See, the boxers were becoming more and more and more militant. And they began to call themselves the Militia United in Righteousness for the first time one year later at the Battle of Senlu Temple in October of 1899. There, a clash between boxers and Qing government troops would occur. And by using the word militia rather than boxers, they were trying to distance themselves from the forbidden martial arts sects that were becoming a problem around the country, and they wanted to give their movement more legitimacy. Violence towards missionaries and Christians would only grow more common and more severe, and this would draw a sharp response from diplomats that were protecting their nationals. In 1899, the French minister in Beijing helped the missionaries to obtain an edict that granted official status to every order of the Roman Catholic hierarchy which is something that would essentially enable local priests to go and support people in legal or family disputes, something that would bypass local officials, so that no longer did the Qing government have to be involved. Instead, the church would be involved. After the German government would take over Shandong, many Chinese people feared that foreign missionaries and possibly all Christian activities were not just simple evangelizing missionary efforts. No, no, no. These were imperialist attempts at trying to colonize China piece by piece. And in 1899, then, the Qing political elite were trying to figure out what do they do in order to try and maintain power. They didn't know. All they could see was all these varying movements that were popping up across the country, and they had to be able to do something. 
And so the Qing government came to view the boxers as a means by which, hey, without officially going against the foreign powers, we can still go against the foreign powers. The national crisis the country was facing was widely perceived as being caused by foreign aggression, even though afterwards when all this went down, the majority of Chinese people, like actual Chinese people on the ground, were in fact grateful for the actions of the alliance to put the whole rebellion down. The Qing government was corrupt, horribly so by this time. Common people often faced extortions from government officials, and the government offered no real protection from the violent action of the boxers or bandits or anyone. It was just this overarching elite that nothing could be done about on the ground. It was really decayed by that point in its history. In January of 1900, with a majority of conservatives in the imperial court, Empress Dowager Cixi, after, you know, taking over everything, went and changed her position on the boxers and instead issued edicts that would defend them. This caused protests from foreign powers who were none too happy about a group of psychotic martial artists going around and killing missionaries and officials. Cixi urged provincial authorities to instead support the boxers, although ultimately very few ever actually did so. In spring of 1900, the boxer movement would spread rapidly from Shandong into the surrounding countryside near Beijing, and boxers would go and start burning down Christian churches. They would kill Chinese Christians. They would do anything they could to intimidate Chinese officials who stood in their way. And so on the 30th of May, the diplomats, led by British Minister Claude Maxwell MacDonald, went and requested that foreign soldiers come to Beijing in order to defend the legations. The Chinese government did reluctantly agree to this because, you know, they still needed to be protected. And the very next day, a multinational force of 435 Navy troops from eight different countries went and debarked from warships and would travel by train from Daku to Beijing. There, they would set up defensive perimeters around their respective missions, and they would wait. Very quickly afterwards, things would begin to grow worse. On the 5th of June, 1900, the railway line to Tianjin was cut by boxers in the countryside, and Beijing was isolated. It was cut off. On the 11th of June, at Yongdin Gate, the secretary of the Japanese legation, Sugiyama Akira, was attacked and killed by soldiers of General Dong Fuxiang, who were guarding the southern part of Beijing Walled City. On the 11th of June, the first boxer was seen in the legation quarter. The German minister, Clemens von Kettler, and German soldiers went and captured a boxer boy and, from there, executed him. In response, thousands of boxers burst into the walled city of Beijing that afternoon and burned many of the Christian churches and cathedrals in the city, burning some of their victims still inside of these churches alive. American and British missionaries would then take refuge in one of the Methodist missions there, and an attack was repulsed by American Marines. The soldiers at the British embassy, as well as the German legations, shot and killed several boxers. Meanwhile, boxer forces, along with other Chinese forces, then went and attacked and killed Chinese Christians all around the legations in revenge for attacks upon the Chinese. As the situation grew more and more violent, the eight powers authorities at Dagu went and dispatched a second multinational force to Beijing on the 10th of June 1900. This force of 2,000 sailors and marines was under the command of Vice Admiral Edward Seymour of the Royal Navy, the largest contingent of the sailors being British. The force moved by train from Dagu to Tianjin with the agreement of the Chinese government. But it didn't matter that the government had agreed to let them pass. The railway had already been severed between Tianjin and Beijing. So Seymour resolved to continue forward by rail to the break and just repair the railway as they went, or from there, if they had to, progress on foot if necessary. This being because really the total distance at this point was only around 120 kilometers from Tianjin to Beijing, so it wouldn't take all that long necessarily. The court at this time, though, was experiencing a bit of trouble. The Qing court would end up replacing Prince Qing with the Manchu Prince Duan, who was severely anti-foreign and pro-boxer. This individual would soon order the imperial army to attack the foreign forces. And confused by receiving conflicting orders from Beijing, one saying to let them pass and the other saying, hey, go and kill them, General Nie Shijing let Seymour's army pass by in their trains and didn't try to take them out. After leaving Tianjin, the force quickly reached Langfeng, but the railway had also been destroyed there. 
Seymour's engineers tried to repair the line, but the entire time that they were doing so, the force itself was surrounded as the railway in both directions, behind and in front of them, were destroyed. So yes, the Chinese, after they arrived, went in and took out the railway behind them so they wouldn't be able to just retreat. They were then attacked from all sides by Chinese irregulars and imperial troops. 5,000 of Dong Fuxiang's Gansu Braves and an unknown number of boxers, we really don't know how many, ended up winning a victory that was extremely costly in terms of life for them, but still a victory over Seymour's troops at the Battle of Longfan on the 18th of June. The problem was, is that the Seymour force could not locate the Chinese artillery, which was continuously raining down shells upon their position. The Chinese troops were at the same time employing mining efforts, engineering efforts, they were flooding the land, they were attacking simultaneously from multiple directions, they were employing pincer maneuvers, they were ambushing, they were using snipers, they were using everything that they could to slow down and try and crush this foreign force that had arrived. They survived, but they were badly losing at this point. On the 18th of June, Seymour learned of attacks on the legation quarter in Beijing and decided to continue advancing, this time along the Beihe River towards Tongzhou, which was around 25 kilometers from Beijing. By the 19th of June, the force was stopped by progressively stiffening resistance and, from there, had to retreat southward along the river, with over 200 people having been wounded. The force by this time was low on food. It had very little ammunition left. There was no medical supplies in order to treat the wounded. And from there, they discovered the Great Zhigu Arsenal, a hidden Qing munitions cache of which the eight powers had no knowledge until then, and they went in and seized it. This would end up being a miracle for them, allowing them to survive and recuperate for a time. From there, they would dig in and just wait for rescue. One of the Chinese servants that they had managed to slip through the boxers and imperial lines, reaching Tianjin, and went and informed the eight powers of the predicament that Seymour was in. His force was surrounded by imperial troops and boxers. It was being attacked almost constantly around the clock, and there was nothing that they could do about it. At any given moment, they could be overrun. So the eight powers had to send a relief column from Tianjin. They sent 1,800 men, 900 of those being Russian troops from Port Arthur, along with 500 British seamen and a number of other assorted troops in order to try and relieve them. On the 25th of June, this relief column would end up reaching Seymour, and from there, the Seymour force would decide that they were not going to hold the arsenal to leave it in Chinese hands. Instead, they decided that they were going to destroy it. They sabotaged the captured field guns that they had so that upon trying to fire them, they would explode. They set fire to any ammunitions that they were not actually going to be able to take, and from there, the force in the relief column marched back to Tenzin unopposed on the 26th of June. The casualties that they had faced during this time was 62 killed and 228 wounded. The whole thing was ultimately a failure. And so the difficult military situation in Tianjin and a complete and total breakdown of communications between Tianjin and Beijing, the allied nations needed to take steps to reinforce their military presence significantly as much as they possibly could. On the 17th of June, they took the Dagu forts that commanded the approaches to Tianjin. And from there, they brought increasing numbers of troops on shore in, try, in order to try and shore up their position. When Xi Xi received an ultimatum that same day from the forces demanding that China surrender total control over all of its military and finances to foreigners, she would state before the Grand Council, now the powers have started the aggression and the extinction of our nation is imminent. If we just fold our arms and yield to them, I would have no face to see our ancestors after death. If we must perish, why don't we fight to the death? And it was at that point that Xi Xi would fully throw her weight behind the boxers and begin to blockade the legations with the armies of the Peking Field Force, which began the siege. On receipt of the news that the attack on the Dagu forts on the 19th of June had occurred, Empress Dowager Xi Xi immediately sent an order to the legations that the diplomats and other foreigners needed to depart Beijing, and they would be able to do so under escort of the Chinese army within 24 hours. Essentially, what it is they were being told is that they would be allowed to leave, and they would be protected by the army. No harm would come to them, but they didn't know if this was actually going to be the case. The very next morning, diplomats from the legations in the siege 
they met together in order to try and discuss what to do about the Empress's offer. The majority agreed that there was no way that they could actually trust the Chinese army. And fearing that they all would be killed, they refused to go and just give in to the Empress's demand. One of them, the German imperial envoy, Baron Clemens von Kettler, the individual that we talked about earlier, was so angry with the actions of the Chinese army troops that he was determined to go and complain directly to the royal court. And so against the advice of the other foreigners that were telling him, hey, buddy, please do not go and do this, the Baron went and left the legations with a single person to go with him, a single aide, along with a team of porters to help carry his sedan chair. And on his way to the palace, Von Kettler was then subsequently killed in the streets of Beijing by a Manchu force. His aide did luckily manage to escape from the attack and would carry word of the Baron's death back to the diplomatic compound. When news of this reached the diplomats, they feared that they too would also be murdered if they went and left the legation quarter. And so they chose to continue to defy the Chinese. They would not leave. They would not depart Beijing. The legations were very quickly fortified as well as they could, and most of the foreign civilians, which included a large number of missionaries and businessmen, would end up taking refuge in the British legation, the largest of the diplomatic compounds. Chinese Christians were primarily housed in the adjacent palace of Prince Su, who had been forced to abandon his property by the foreign soldiers. On the 21st of June, Empress Dowager Cixi would go and issue an imperial decree, stating that, well, they were basically at war, that hostilities had begun, and from this, she ordered the Chinese army to go and join the boxers and go and attack the invading troops, which, though it wasn't a declaration of war that she was sending to the foreigners, it was de facto a declaration of war. Weirdly enough, despite the fact that she did this, the Allies never at any point made any actual former declaration of war. They, they didn't do that. In fact, even though the emperor ordered for these things to happen, regional governors in the south who commanded very significant armies, ones that had actually been in the process of modernizing, such as those owned by Li Hengzhang at Canton, Yuan Shikai at Shandong, and Zhang Zhidong at Wuhan, they didn't join in. Instead, they formed the Mutual Defense Pact of Southeastern Provinces and didn't do anything. They refused to recognize the Imperial Court's declaration of war, which they declared was a illegitimate order. From that, they then withheld the knowledge of the order from the court from the public. No officials would be told, no peasants would be told, no one would be told of what was going on. In fact, Yuan Shikai would do the opposite. He would end up using his own forces to suppress boxers in Shandong, and Zhang would enter into negotiations with the foreigners in Shanghai in order to keep his army out of the conflict. The neutrality of these provincial and regional governors left the majority of Chinese military forces out of the conflict. They wouldn't participate. And so it was then that the legations of the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Austria-Hungary, Italy, Belgium, Spain, the United States, Netherlands, Japan, and Russia were all located in Beijing in the legation quarter south of the Forbidden City, and all of them were trapped. No relief force had come yet, and the Chinese army and boxer regulars besieged the legation quarter over the course of the 20th of June through the 14th of August 1900. A total of 473 foreign civilians, 409 soldiers, marines, and sailors from eight different countries along with 3,000 Chinese Christians all took refuge there trying to save their lives. And under the command of the British minister to China, Claude Maxwell MacDonald, the legation staff and military guards would defend the compound with anything they could find. Small arms, three machine guns that they had managed to find. At one point, they were making spears and giving it to locals in order to try and protect themselves, including one very old muzzle-loaded cannon that they ended up pushing together, basically, to use. This was something that ended up earning a very interesting name called the International Gun, because, get this, right, the barrel was British, the carriage that it was on was Italian, the shells being used by it were Russian, and the crew that was actually operating it was American. Really, it was being used by everyone. It was just, it, just an interesting little detail. Chinese Christians in the legations had led the foreigners to the cannon, and it proved to be extremely important for their defense, despite being horribly outdated and also a complete mismatch. Also under siege in Beijing was the Northern Cathedral at Beitong of the Catholic Church, and this was its own fascinating detail because the Beitong was defended by only 43 French and Italian soldiers, along with 33 Catholic foreign priests and nuns, 
and about 3,200 Chinese Catholics. The defenders suffered extremely heavy casualties from lack of food and from mines, which the Chinese went and exploded in tunnels that were dug beneath the compound. The number of Chinese soldiers and boxers that were besieging the legation quarter and the Beitang is unknown, but it was immense. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and give this little detail right now about the Beitang, but the, uh, the, the bishop or the guy who was in control of the cathedral in the end, once the siege was actually over and they survived, he would later remark that it was sad that they had not all died, because if they did, then they would have been martyrs. Like, literally hearkening back to the old detail uh, within early Christianity, where people would actively want to get persecuted and killed by the Roman government, because then it was basically guaranteed that they would go to heaven, because they were martyrs. It's just fascinating. Very, very interesting detail to take. Anyway. On the 22nd and 23rd of June, Chinese soldiers and boxers went and set fire to areas that were north and west of the British legation, using this as a tactic in order to try and scare the defenders and also drive them from their defensive positions. The nearby Hunlin Academy, which was a complex of courtyards and buildings that housed what was at the time the greatest library in all of China, the oldest and richest library in the world that had survived at that point, it also was lit on fire. Both sides would end up blaming each other for the destruction of the books, but considering what happened here, the Chinese actually setting the fire in the first place, uh, yeah, that's, um, you can probably guess who is to blame in that situation. After the failure to burn out the foreigners, the Chinese army adopted a strategy of continuously trying to strangle the defenders. And I don't mean breaking in with string or anything and actually tying it around their necks. No, no, no. I mean that the Chinese gradually tried to move in Closer and closer, inch by inch, building barricades as they would get closer, surrounding the legation quarter, and advance brick by brick on the foreign lines to force the guards to retreat just a few feet at a time. While this sounds like a long-winded and awful strategy at first, it is very smart. And over time, this tactic would end up forcing the defenders into smaller and smaller and smaller territory that if in an area that gets bombed, way more people are going to be hit at that time. One of the places where this was occurring was in the Fu, defended by Japanese and Italian sol uh, sailors and soldiers, and this was inhabited by most of the Chinese Christians, as we said earlier. Bullets, artillery, firecrackers, anything that you could imagine was being thrown against the legations in this spot every single night, but it didn't really do much damage. Largely, the defenders behind their defenses couldn't really be touched, but snipers could still work. The whole point was to keep them tired, keep them exhausted, make sure that they couldn't actually respond. And meantime, if anyone did actually poke their head up, then they could potentially be hit by a sniper. Despite their numerical advantage, though, the Chinese did not ever attempt a direct assault and storm the legation quarter. That did not happen. The defenses were pretty strong, after all. The Germans and the Americans occupied perhaps the most crucial of all the defensive positions, this being the Tartar Wall. This was a 45-foot tall and 40-foot wide wall, and it was incredibly important. The German barricades faced east on top of the wall, and 400 yards west were the west-facing American positions. The Chinese managed to advance towards both positions by building barricades gradually closer and closer and closer. As the American commander, Captain John T. Myers, would say, quote, the men all feel they are in a trap and simply await the hour of execution. On the 30th of June, the Chinese managed to force the Germans off the wall, leaving the American Marines alone in their defense. At the same time that this was happening, a Chinese barricade was advanced to within only a few feet of the American positions, and it became clear the Americans were going to have to abandon their wall or they were going to have to force the Chinese to retreat. So it was then that at 2 a.m. on the 3rd of July, 56 British, Russian, and American Marines and sailors under the command of Myers launched an assault on the Chinese barricade on the wall. The attack caught the Chinese asleep. They managed to kill about 20 of them and expelled the rest of them from the barricades. The Chinese would then not attempt to advance their positions on the Tartar Wall for the remainder of the siege. And remember, the entire time that all this is going on, the foreign powers in the eight-nation alliance are trying to get in there as quickly as they can. Austria-Hungary, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, Russia, the United Kingdom, United States, they're all trying to get in there, and the force that they end up dispatching is led by British Lieutenant General Alfred Gasly, 
who would act as the commanding officer of the force that would number 55,000 men. The main contingent was composed of Japanese, 20,840, Russian, 13,150, British, 12,020, French, 3,520, the United States, 3,420, German, 900, Italian, 80, Austro-Hungarian, 75, and the remainder was composed of anti-boxer Chinese troops. The international force would finally capture Tianjin on the 14th of July, and it is here that they would end up suffering their greatest casualties. With Tianjin then as a base, the international force would march from it to Beijing, around 120 kilometers away, with 20,000 allied troops. On the 4th of August, there were approximately 70,000 Qing imperial troops and anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 boxers along the way, but we don't really know. Despite that, the Allies only encountered minor resistance, fighting battles at Beizang and Yangkun, and not really much happened in these. The biggest problem that they faced was the weather. Conditions at this time were extremely humid, with temperatures sometimes reaching 42 degrees Celsius or 108 degrees Fahrenheit. The high temperatures, the insects, all this stuff during this time plagued the Allies. Soldiers became dehydrated, horses died, Chinese villagers during this time would attack and kill Allied troops that were searching for wells to try and parch their thirst. The heat is really what ended up killing the Allied soldiers and effectively driving a number of them insane. The tactics along the way were gruesome. And by this, I mean the ones that are used by both sides. Allied soldiers would walk around beheading already dead Chinese corpses. They would bayonet or behead live Chinese citizens. And there were numerous cases of Chinese girls and women being sexually assaulted. Cossacks from the Russian side were reported to have killed Chinese civilians almost automatically. And there was even reports that a Japanese contingent kicked a Chinese soldier to death. The Chinese responded to the alliance's atrocities with similar acts of their own, and especially towards captured Russians, they would be immensely cruel. The Japanese would also meet similar fates, and Lieutenant Smedley Butler of the United States would end up seeing the remains of two Japanese soldiers nailed to a wall who had their tongues cut off and their eyes gouged out. The march to Beijing would take 10 days under this brutal heat. And despite the intense hostility that was faced by foreigners in June, the Eight Nation Alliance expedition to Beijing didn't really see much resistance. On August 15th, 1900, U.S. forces officially would enter the international legation quarters. That same day, Empress Dowager Cixi would flee from Beijing, allowing the Western powers to occupy the city. Overall, the relatively bloodless victory of the alliance meant that the entire thing was a huge prestige boost for all of them. In particular, for Japan, this is something that would end up marking them as being part of the civilized developed nations. It was part of the club. Now, I'm going to say civilized with quotes here because what would end up happening afterwards was definitely not civilized. Despite the fact that the Hague Convention had already made it so that looting and whatnot should not occur, troops from most nations, it seems, with the exception of American and Japanese troops, then engaged in plunder, looting, and rape. And unfortunately, the German troops in particular seems to have been very involved in this after Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany had issued an order on July 27th to, quote, make the name German remembered in China for a thousand years so that no Chinaman will ever again dare to even squint at a German, end quote. On September 7th, 1901, the Qing court was then compelled to sign the Boxer Protocol and from that, execute 10 officials that were linked to the outbreak of the rebellion. In addition to this, they were ordered to pay war reparations of $333 million. The court's humiliating failure to defend China against foreign powers contributed to the growth of Republican feeling, which over time was going to culminate and result in the dynasty being overthrown and the establishment of the Republic of China. Foreign privileges, which is something that had severely angered Chinese people from the largely unequal treaties, would continue on, not being canceled until going into the 1930s and 40s. Meanwhile, the entire time that this was happening on just the coast and going into the rivers, Russia had been extremely busy. They would go on to occupy much of the northeastern province of Manchuria, which was a move that threatened Anglo-American hopes of maintaining what remained of China's territorial integrity and openness to commerce, the uh, so-called open-door policy. But this is not, there's not really anything they could do about it at this time. 
This behavior would lead ultimately to the disastrous Russian defeat over the course of the Russo-Japanese War, which is something that I definitely want to do a podcast episode on, as Japan was getting more and more and more confident. First, the Sino-Japanese War. Now this, really, the world in Asia was their oyster, and there was anything that they could do now to make it rightfully theirs. But everyone, my friends, that is the end of the Boxer Rebellion. Thank you so much for listening and or watching, depending upon where it is that you're getting this from. I hope to see you all here next time. I know this was a little bit of an odd way this all was set up since I haven't done one of these in a while that was completely by myself. And it's definitely going to look different on YouTube in comparison to what I normally do with a lot of my more highly edited videos. So without further ado, I wish you all a good rest of your day. Thank you for joining us, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye, my friends.